Hi, uh, my name is Sandro Hawk, and I work for the W3C. I've been doing semantic web technologies and linked data for a long time now, and I think it's time to make linked data be simple and straightforward, and I want everyone to be using it. So in the talk I'm about to give, uh, I'm going to cover the basic technologies, the prerequisites um, of what you need to know to do linked data, and then I'm going to dig into the meat of actually how you do linked data. I'll also give a little context, the surrounding technologies, um, and uh, during the talk there'll be probably some question and answers too. Um, so this is going to be a slightly different level talk than the last one, and then some of the ones we have here. Uh, the question came up several times in recent months, sort of what is this linked data thing, and various people tried to explain it, and uh, those explanations the feedback was we're also really high up there and confusing and hard to put the pieces together. So I figured I would try to start from the ground up and uh, um, I don't think this will be boring even if you know the stuff but hopefully it'll give you the background even uh, it, it, for when you, you don't know it all. So my, my rough outline is I'm going to give a little context for what, where linked data fits into the world, motivate it a little, talk about some of the prerequisites, um, and then specifically talk about this idea of using live URIs as identifiers, which is really the heart of linked data. I'll mention a bit of related work, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions, although maybe we'll move those to the pub, depending when they drag us out of here. So for technology context, um, this is kind of a reframing from how I've seen other people talk about it before. but. I think of, we've got this circle of web technologies, which I did as a red circle here. You know, all the standard web technologies, and there's a hundred more that I didn't bother to write down here, but the big ones, of course, HTML, HTTP, JavaScript, things like that. And we have the circle of blue technologies, semantic technologies, speech recognition, logic programming, KR, knowledge representation, uh, DL, description logic. And then the intersection here, we have this, things that are both web technologies and semantic technologies, you know, semantic web technologies. And this is the things that we normally talk about here. And I'm framing this as, this is a set of technologies rather than a thing. Because I don't know that the web is really a thing, and I don't know that the semantic web is really a thing. It's much more a whole set of different technologies people use to build this sort of vast interconnected system. So when people say, what is the semantic web? I'm like, you know, that's not a, a useful question. The question is, what are the semantic web technologies? What can we do with them? And, and so, and then we zero in today, we're gonna talk about this linked data technology, one bit in the middle there. Um, a funny note about this slide, URIs is the one line here. The one thing here that I couldn't figure out where that should go, it sort of crosses the border, and this is why people have been fighting about it for 15 years, because it's not one community that owns URIs like all these other things. It's two different communities pulling at it. So I want to talk about the flow of data a little bit, what we're going to see. At the bottom here, we have all sorts of different possible sources of data in the world. Data in uh, SQL databases, spreadsheets, various XML formats, um, raw sensor data, crowdsource data, whatever you name it. And the idea, the basic semantic web idea, is you funnel those all into RDF triples. And then the simplest thing is you f send yeah, them there up to the web, your web data apps, whatever those apps are. Um, and linked data introduces sort of a different way of you funnel them through this linked data approach and then goes to apps. And I'm not going to talk about inference today, which is still a, another thing that builds on that. But that's a whole other topic. So what we're trying to do here is um, have apps be able to find the data and, and do so without centralization. Centralization is the easy way to do anything. Um, but whenever it causes problems, you start to realize actually we should fall back to a decentralized approach. So, you know, we don't want any central bottlenecks for performance. We don't want a central point of failure. You know, Google is great that they almost never go down, but when they do go down, oh my God, it's bad. So you really would like to architect systems like the web that just don't have any single point of failure. No central policies, right? Facebook is great, you can build your whole life on it until you decide you don't like their privacy policy, then you're stuck. So you'd like to have nothing centralized there at all. No need for anybody's permission for you to sign up, sign up and use it. Another basic thing we try to do with linked data is use existing social structures, not dictate anything new there, and use existing web technology structures. What we're trying to allow is that anybody can say anything. 
Um, you know, whatever your business or projects or thoughts, whatever it is you have, you put it out there. You can do that on the web right now, but with linked data, we want to be able to have machines find it and analyze it and reuse it in a way that just hu humans by hand going from web page to web page can't tractably do. You know, scan a thousand web pages or a hundred thousand web pages and tell me, you know, what's the cheapest lemonade in my neighborhood and, and have this be a very simple app that anybody can use. Yeah, that's the goal here. So how do we do it? I'm bro I've broken this down into three parts. The first two of which I would consider prerequisites. So I'm going to cover them fairly quickly. The three parts are to be linkable, have your data be linkable, to show your triples, and to use live URIs. So the first one being linkable. This is basically standard web technology. This applies to every website. Many of them haven't quite figured it out yet, but they're getting closer and closer. Ten years ago, it was nobody really had this down, but it's, it's getting there. You know, there's basic ideas of whatever information you have, put it out on your website. Um, in general, I suggest using content management systems like Drupal or whatever fits your organization rather than, you know, using plain files. People have pretty much given up on plain files and now realize they should use a CMS. Um, in general, if you have much other than text, it's good to offer some APIs to it. We could talk about that for a few hours if we wanted. An important thing people are finally getting the hang of with blogging is good, using good URLs. You know, make it so that if somebody reads the URL, they have a pretty good idea what they're going to get at. So these are all things that are true for the existing web, and they're sort of more so true for the semantic web. Um, you like to pick your URL such that it even is going to make sense to people and not be confusing 10 years in the future. It's hard to do, but it's worth trying to do. Um, more sophisticated technology bits. It's good to support caching. There's this whole cache protocol in the web that a lot of websites still don't get right where you say when you publish a particular page, it's, good, it's okay to cache this for 10 minutes, or it's okay to cache this for one second, or it's okay to cache this for six hours. W3.org defaults to six hours for most things, so it behaves very quickly through any sort of caching, because ch pages don't change that quickly. Another bit of prerequisite technology is something called content negotiation. A lot of people don't know that when your browser, when you put a URL into your browser or web address and get some content back, there's a bit of negotiation that goes on under the scenes about what formats your browser supports for images like ping or GIF or SVG, and a bit of negotiation about language, like do you want it in English or German or French. So the fact that content negotiation, that this happens on the web, most people don't realize, but when you're working with data, it's very nice to realize you have this possibility of um, somebody asking for the content and there being a negotiation about exactly what format you get that back in. Um, my, my final comment, and this is something that nobody seems to have really gotten yet, um, if, if you want to be building on these things for many years in the future, you want to have some kind of a URL survival plan. You know, we're building, you know, Drupal is building on Shock and Fof and so forth, and Fof is run by one guy, and if he gets hit by a bus, who knows what happens. The UK government data is built on Fof. <laughs> this is probably not a good long-term plan. So if Dan Brickley, he, 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 he's given other people keys to that server, but you know, having some really clear documented legal and social procedure for what happens and how these sites stay up and are maintained in perpetuity is really important. Um, something that people are gonna have to be working on for years to come. Okay, that was prerequisite one, the sort of general be linkable theory that you should know. The second general prerequisite is RDF, which I would call as, you know, show your triples. Think of all your data in this sort of simple form for everything you can think of that you care about, every item of interest, for each question that somebody might ask about that thing, what's the answer? So we have a subject, we have some sort of a property, some, some aspect of it that you want to talk about, and then what's the answer to that? These are these RDF triples, you know, so for instance about Massachusetts, um, we could say, who's the governor? And the answer is Deval Patrick, uh, and that's a you know, person. About Massachusetts, we could say, well, what's the nickname? It's the Bay State, what's the capital? The capital is Boston. Simple you know, thing, question about it, answer about it. This is an RDF triple. And this cascades because you know, we said Boston has a capital, well, or sorry, Massachusetts has a capital which is Boston. 
And uh, then we can go on and ask about, well, what about Boston? Does Boston have a nickname? Does Boston have a capital? No, that doesn't make any sense. Does Boston have a governor? No, as a political leader, anyway. There's all these sorts of questions and answers. But it's the breaking down of things into triples. Um, we commonly view that as a graph. Again, probably most of you have seen this kind of diagram before, where I just said what I said before, but in circles and arrows. So we have Massachusetts have a, has a governor, a nickname, a capital. Boston itself has a nickname and so forth. But you hear the term graph with RDF a lot because it's often thought of this way. There are a couple different syntaxes for writing this down. Turtle or M3, which are the same for these purposes, is one simple way to do it. I'm not going to get into the details here, but the point is in a few simple lines, you can say Massachusetts has a governor, Deval Patrick, a nickname, Bay State, a capital, Boston. Boston itself has a nickname, Beantown, and so forth. Um, there's an XML syntax, RDF XML. This is the most standard, most oldest way to write down RDF. It's verbose and hard to read, but it works. So working with RDF summary is there's a bunch of different ways to write down these triples. There's lots of software and libraries. Um, there's a query language, Sparkle. It works over HTTP like everything else on the web. You can transfer these files around. Um, this is where content negotiation comes back into play of I can publish in all these formats at once and somebody can ask for some bit of RDF and they get it in the format they wanted. Um, so that's a, a nice way to do this. So then the question is, these are two prere prerequisites, the question is how do you find the data you want? And, and there was a quick and easy answer when RDF first came along 12 years ago or so, because in those days they thought RDF was just going to be used as metadata. It was just going to be, there's a website, and in this case I've taken the website of the city of Boston, and on that web page there would be this embedded data about the website because this was before search engines really worked very well, <laughs> if you can imagine those days. Um, and we thought we'd need to say on each website, you know, what kind of category site it was and what are some keywords for it and so forth. And that's what RDF was originally pictured for. Well, at least, I mean, some people thought of it that way. Um, and so there we would have triples like this one I've done here. You know, the subject is the city of Boston website. And maybe the property or question is, when was it created? And the answer for this particular site is February 1st, 2001. I was able to go back and figure that out. Um, so there's our little RDF triple metadata about the site. And, and that has the nice property of given the URL of the site, I can find out that triple. I, you know, I do normal web dereference, I give it the URL, I get back some data. And, and it took a while before people, well, I mean, so, yeah, so that works. You can do this, this, this get, you get back the data. Um, and it turned out this didn't actually catch on. But people had another idea about the same time. Um, there was this whole concept around what exactly is a web page and a web identifier and URLs and URIs. This is all in the 90s and nobody cares about it anymore, I hope. But you do see um, URIs still implemented in lots of software outside the web. You see these mail to URIs like this one and mail ID user URIs. If you look inside lots of software these days, it's got these things. And, and out of that generaliz generalizing the notion of a web address came the idea that maybe anything can have a URI, maybe not just a web page. And we, we, we switch from URL to URI when we do this because URL is this you know, web page address and URI is an anything address and an anything identifier. Um, and what exactly they look like wasn't determined. Um, but we got this idea that we could identify anything. You know, I just sort of brainstormed a little bit here about some of the things I've seen people want to do with this. People, places, governments, companies, products, songs, musicians, concerts, a particular concert. You know, what is the identifier for that concert? Or a speech, or a course at MIT, or a school, or a building, or a walkway. Individual plants. The city of um, District of Columbia, uh, you know, has a database of individual plants because the you know, city services has to maintain that tree and that tree and that tree has a disease and that tree is located at this location and was planted in this date. They've got this kind of database. I suspect every city with a maintenance department has these databases. So if you start to want to share this data, you need IDs for individual plants. And you've got the species of the plant, species of animals, etc. All these things we want to identify. So the question is, what do these URIs look like? You know, what URI do we use for Boston itself? We need to be careful because Boston is not a web page. Boston was created in 1630, 
the city of Boston.gov was created in 2001. Um, so we were faced with this problem um, some eight or nine years ago of, of we want to assign your eyes to things, to everything, um, but we don't want to confuse them with all these web pages. So this was the challenge. And this is what linked data is trying to address and does address. In fact, it grows out of the fact that we were able to solve this problem eventually. I'm going to talk through three different solutions, one of which is experimental and two of which are pretty well accepted now. Um, the first one is colloquially called hash URIs. And this uses the idea of the fragment syntax. You know, if you see a URI that's got this number sign, which some people call a hash sign, um, at the end, and we all know that means that points to a place in the middle of a page, right? Um, and it turned out there was a, 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 whole, a loophole, essentially, in the specs for URIs that say, well, what that hash means, that fragment means, it doesn't actually mean a piece in a web page. It actually means it depends on what content you get back. If you get back HTML, yes, it means a point in that web page. If you get back a video, it means a place in that video. If you get back a piece of RDF, that's up to the RDF spec to say what that means. And so the RDF spec that says that means anything in the world. So this little hook in the specs let us do this. And so, so we have this example here, Tim Berners-Lee's um, here's the URL of a, a data page he has, which I think now maybe I got wrong. But anyway, you can imagine. This is a web page he has, or a page of RDF he has. And on that one, the fragment hash i at the end identifies Tim, not a web page. But because when we hand this to the protocol, the protocol of re dereferencing data, getting data from a URI, the protocol says, I don't care about fragments. Ch ch just chop that stuff off. You're not even allowed to hand that to the protocol. You've got to chop that off in the library before you hand it across the web. And then you just get back the content. So we have two different URIs. We have the URI for Tim and we have the t URI for this content about Tim. And they're separate, distinguishable. One is you know, like Boston and the other is like the page about Boston. But we can get from one to the other. Good so question? How does that actually identify Tim? Is, is there something in the standard or in the definition of what's on the page at that location? Well, so really what it is, is it's free to identify anything we want it to identify. The protocols don't care what it means at all. So it it's, identifies him as a matter of usage. Right. He, he says it identifies him. He documents that it identifies him. He wants people to start using it to identify him. And so it, it ends up in practice, so we hope, identifying him. That already have the page, it'll say that it identifies him. Right. It's true. Yeah, yeah, I, I realize it's not called data. I, I changed, it was my example, and on mine it was called data, but I said it's his birthday, so I figured I'd use him. Um, uh, yeah, so this hash URI approach is the oldest one. This has been pretty much accepted through the life of RDF. Um, and it's used, you'll see it in the W3C recommendations. It's not quite as popular these days, though, as, as solution number two, which are slash URIs. Um, and they're called slash because right at the end there, they don't have a hash. So they have a slash character. These look much more like perfectly normal URLs. And these use a different loophole in a different spec. <laughs> um, and I actually get credit for spotting this loophole in about 2003 in the HTTP spec. The idea here is that we make a perfectly normal looking URL. And here's an example of a working one, dbpd.org slash resource slash Boston. And when you hand that to the protocol and say, yo, tell me about this thing, whatever it is, the server responds with a sort of redirect, like we get when websites move, kind of like a 404 error, which is a, right, another, another number code that we've all seen. 303 is called see other. It just means the server gives you back, I'm not going to give you Boston. I'm going to give you something about Boston, something else related to Boston. So in this case, it gives you back dbp.org slash page slash Boston, which is now a normal RDF page about Boston. So again, we have two URIs. We have the first one about Boston itself, and the second one about 
which identifies this page about Boston. And so we can do metadata about one and metadata about the other. We can use either one in RDF. We say, you know, resource Boston was created in 1630. Page Boston, this particular page Boston was created probably six months ago. I'm not sure. This mode of slash URIs seems to be much more popular recently. Um, it was sort of accepted by the community really 2006 or so. Um, and what I see is all the large-scale deployments of RDF, such as the UK government and DBpedia, um, are all using slash URIs. Yes? There's no particular reason why, why the, the slash Boston URI even needs to be redirected to some valid web page, is there? You could, you could have a URI and t say things about it. Right. It, it could be 404 or something, but then we wouldn't have the nice feature here of being able to find out about Boston. We but want to be able to... The be only way you could do it is by querying RDF triples about it. And, and, and where would you get those? You'd have to have... So before linked data, you could use... In fact, a lot of people weren't using HTTP. They were using, like, um, you know, URNs or, or various other URI schemes that don't allow dereferencing, don't allow you to go across the web to get data. But then you don't get data. You don't get to walk across the web and find more and more sources of data. So is resource analogous to I? Mean, it's obviously analogous to I, but does it mean that it's, it's a thing and not, I mean, is I a keyword and resource a keyword? No, these are, these are completely arbitrary. The, the designer of the particular system, I mean, resource is a, is a, is a nice word to indicate that I'm talking so about the thing itself. If you want to be reading the URL itself, you need to be. But the system, the system doesn't care. The software. How do I know? How do I know? You look at what you get back. Right. That has metadata in it, and you have to query that metadata to find out what it says. Well, so if you were a computer who was given this diagram, of course you'd be given it looking like this. But this is easier for us to read, maybe, except it's so small. Um, you know, there's the URI for Massachusetts, here's the URI for Boston. So you see this and you go, well, I want to know more about this thing. I don't know what this is. I don't have a concept of it. But I can dereference this and I get back about 10,000 triples that tell me all sorts of interesting things about it. I get back the page. Well, in this case, I get redirected to page Boston and then I can fetch the data from that and get the data which then talks about that thing. I wanted to mention solution three, and I put a big question mark here because this is not accepted by the community at all. But um, I expect looking back on this, I don't know, three years? This will be how we're all doing it, maybe five years. Um, uh, but this is a very controversial notion. Controversial notion is the idea that we don't have to make a new URI. We can just use this, you know, cityofboston.gov but sort of somehow indicate that we mean the thing it's about. So, uh, and the reason I think this is catching on is because this is in some ways much simpler. Facebook has this open growth graph protocol they announced a couple months ago now where there's these like buttons sprouting up all over the web. You know, you go to Internet Movie Database and you can say you like a movie or you like an actor. And, uh, and that uses RDF, but it uses the URI of the IMDB page about that actor and the URI of the IMDB page about that movie or the article, the New York Times, whatever it is, you're, 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 liking, liking you're liking the page instead of the actor. And so somewhere we need to say, well, whenever you're talking about that kind of like, we mean this kind of indirection. Yeah, really like the page, <laughs> you're yeah, yeah. So, so there's still some open questions here, and I just wanted to put this out there as saying, I don't think hash and slash are, are the be-all, end-all of how we do this. Um, they both work fine. If you're deploying something now, you should use hash or slash, take your pick. Those are the two you really have to understand, but um, I think there may be room for something else. Um, so briefly sketching, and if I had more time and, and a working demo, I would walk you through exactly how this works, but what you get and what you want here is given some URI, you know, this URI for Boston, you can write an iPhone app or whatever to tell you the mayor's name. We can tell you the mayor's name of any city given the URI of that city. And it can follow links and it can actually tell you the mayor's names of all the nearby cities. And it can tell you 
you know, the mayor's names and the mayor's friends and their names and phone numbers of all the nearby cities. You know, all this stuff just by following the links out because the assuming each of those web pages has the associated links in it. And the idea is we get this sort of ecosystem of apps that want the data and data providers that want to provide the data. And we have an ongoing negotiation and we're just getting started with this, with governments just starting to make their data available. You know, in this room three months ago, I think we had people from Massachusetts and the city of Boston saying, yes, we absolutely want to provide linked data of all the stuff we have, uh, help us do it. And that's slowly underway and UK government is well ahead in doing that and DVpedia and so forth. Yeah, so we don't have a, a really compelling demo right now because there isn't a lot of really high quality linked data out there and there aren't a lot of high quality apps. So there's this catch 22 problem of getting the apps and the data and we're just starting to see them getting underway. And I think, I think it'll be pretty impressive in a couple years once that's going. We end up with this web of data where anybody can publish triples, anybody can read all the public ones. Absolutely. So, so there, there's great demos that don't use linked data and but are therefore... Much more easily if yes. Data existed. Right, right. I've been watching this Somerville crime reports map. That's a really nice yeah, one. Uh, yeah. Um, so the question is how to get those, but having data from lots of different sources, uh, all compiled without special code as each new source comes online. Does W3C see itself as a source of that kind of thing? I mean, are you doing it, is it doing it itself, providing the data? And no, we see ourselves as facilitating other people providing that data. But I mean, about, about the yeah. W3C, because they'd be the only provider for that data. Sure, so I mean, for instance, all of our specifications and working groups and stuff like that, um, we have, <laughs> I don't know, we have already half of that, of most of that stuff available now. You know, sometimes your own dog food doesn't taste so good, but uh, we, we try. Every couple of years we take another look at how to make it more usable. Um, but but it's got, it suffers from this catch-22 of, you know, we first published the RDF of our specifications, I don't know, in 2001 or something, and, and, and Eric implemented the RDF of our access control system in maybe 1999, 1998, and uh, and nobody could look at it, nobody's looking at it yet. So and, and publishing data that nobody's consuming is not a very fun experience. It, it was in so, place for a very short time. Though. Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> so I want to mention briefly um, related topics that I'm not really talking about here, but mention how they fit in together. Of course, they're talked about in this room a lot. Um, RDFS and OWL are ways of documenting your vocabulary is those properties, you know. I gave you the sort of vague notion that the middle part of a triple is this question and sort of the whole analysis of how those fit together and what questions apply to what kind of subjects. That's what OWL and RDFS are about. Um, SCOS is a sort of lighter weight way to just document various different concepts you might have. Um, RIF, the rule interchange format, is a way to translate between data sets. So you have a data, written, data set written in one vocabulary and you want to translate it to one written in another vocabulary. That's where I see it's applicable here. Hopefully that can all be automated and under the covers. Sparkle is a query language. Anything that's visible as RDF, you can query with Sparkle. Um, I had a bunch of open issues which maybe I'll save for the pub. <laughs> Well, now, let me just mention this, because these are questions that we really haven't answered yet at all. Um, things like, how much can you expect an app to harvest? You give it this URL from Boston, how far out should it go? How many links out should it go? What kind of guidance should you give it? This is still very much an open question. I haven't talked about inference, but there's lots of different kinds of processing from some data to more data. What should you expect clients to do there? Um, People have proposals here, but there's no consensus about this yet. So we're in this ecosystem of feeling things out. Finding good sources of data, good vocabularies, establishing backlinks and crosslinks between sources. Um, there's no easy to use generalized client. You know, tabulator is probably the best generalized client right now, but it is not easy to use by any stretch of the imagination. So you'd like to be able to really easily sift through this data and see it nicely visualized, and that's not there yet, at least that I know of. We've had some demos here that are pretty good. Um, smooth integration with the HTML web, being able to publish this 
you know, the Drupal example is a great example of, of where this is going and, and could go, where you're, it, you're creating your HTML website and you also create some uh, RDF data at the same time. And of course, you know, business models, how to make money with this stuff, another open issue. Uh, summary, you haven't forgotten anything I've said, but I'll, I'll leave that up. I can take a couple quick questions and then we'll go to the pub. Yes. You, I thought I heard you say that the, that the the quality of the data, or the data isn't there, and yet you look at that the, the, the uh, cloud of linked data, mm -hmm. and watch the bubbles grow in everybody's presentation. Right. So I kind of have a disconnect with that. So. I <laughs> It depends who you're talking to and for what sort of application. The data, there is lots of data there, but what quality of data it is and um, how much, whether it's really the data you want, I think we're still just really scratching the surface. We have some really impressive little demos, um, but we're not at the point where you can envision an app you know, this lemonade stand, local lemonade stands, and go find sources and put it all together right now. You know, we're not nearly there. You can maybe find some kinds of local businesses that made some filings with some state department, st state agency two years ago, you know, but really you'd like that stuff to be up to date to the minute. There's no reason it shouldn't be, this is the web. Uh, you know, so there's sort of different standards of what you're expecting and what you'll find. Yeah. The status of FOF, you talked about some limitations that it's facing right now, but is that available and usable for people? Uh, FOF is absolutely usable, um, and it's sort of the best we've got for, I don't know if it's the best we've got. It's one of two or three really good contenders for talking about people and names and organizations and addresses and things like that. But it is still just one very dedicated, very good hobbyists project. and. I'm a little concerned about stability there, and I would like to see that kind of thing turn into something that has more institutional backing behind it. Yeah? So you mentioned up to date, uh, mm -hmm. but nothing in what you said addresses issues of time, timestamps, versions, currency, when was the data reported, when was it last updated, what's the story on all that? Right. Um, so mostly I think of those as orthogonal to this. All that applies to normal HTML web pages as well. Um, Who is the mayor of Boston? <laughs> right, right, right. And, and the UK government has done some pretty good things there. They have, you know, school data for each particular filing every six months. And they're using, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a property in DC terms which relates uh, a particular resource to the date, the date range of applicability of that resource. So I, there isn't a consensus solution out there yet, but um, I'd suggest maybe that's a good place to look, and I would like to see a lot more settled down there, obviously. I think it's all doable, we just don't have consensus solutions to how exactly to do it yet. I would add it's not orthogonal. You need a way in Sparkle, for example, to say what date you want the data as of, for example. But that can be we, we, could, we could dig into this. Yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, stability, say, of folk, um, would um, uh, shareware, so uh, what's the big uh, place where people come together to write programs? I'm just blank. Yeah, right. So would that model, you think, work? RFC does. RFC is... No, I, I, I think something like SourceForge, a sort of where there is an institutional commitment to keep the website up and running and a set of maintainers, I think that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Hyper data is all based on wiki. That's a pretty good model until you want more, you want something that's going to be rigid over 10 or 100 years. Okay. Other questions? Lee? How much of the, so a major thing, if not the major thing that separates or that distinguishes linked data from using semantic web technology, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. that all the identifiers are resolvable. Right. And my question is, just, well, just your opinion, of how much of the value of being able to resolve the identifiers is really a value for the human developer coming across new data sets and working with new identifiers and properties and resources versus mm -hmm. the software actually making use of that ability at runtime 
And then do you think that balance of value is going to change over time? Yeah. So, uh, um, right. I think right now, we don't see a lot of sophisticated linked data apps. So in fact, the fact that you can resolve these URIs is mostly used by developers who are trying to find out what a property means. Um, but as we get, as we go by and start to evolve these ways of, of developing apps that really do gather all the data around Boston, and, and um, then, then that will be the dominant application. We'll be actually linked data apps that gather everything looking themselves. And it won't be humans dereferencing it. Use linked data. Um, let me see if I understand your question right. Uh, a particular linked data app is going to be written assuming a particular vocabulary. It's going to be looking for mayors of cities, in my example, or lemonade stands, knowing what the properties of lemonade stands are. And so it will only find data that uses that same vocabulary. And my hope is that RIF will be deployed as a way of translating between multiple vocabularies. So it will find data in the vocabulary it's written against and any that can translate to or from that. But we're not quite there yet. Then where do you Level, there the so the, the, the dis disambiguation has to happen before you put it into triples. By the time it's already F triples, okay. those are unambiguous. Then you need, you, it, you need some kind of, I hesitate to use the word ontology because I think that's heavier weight than you need. You need some vocabulary, which doesn't have to be formalized to write an RDF. You know, as I phrase it very informally, you need to know what questions you're asking and answering about the items in your data set. You do have to have those in mind to, to write these triples. Um, and how standard has to be? It, 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 it has to be standardized among readers and writers of that particular data set. So I, I suggest... <laughs> it's very absolute the way that you just stated it, and I strongly disagree with that. Mm -hmm. It does not have to be standardized. I can create a vocabulary right now, write it down, and describe some stuff, and put it in front of you. It's not standardized at all, but you'll be able to read it. Okay. Stan yeah, I, I, standardized is, is probably the wrong word there. But we have to have some kind of common understanding of the vocabulary. Or, or maybe consistency but, in the data. And, and that set of triples. The, the, the quality yeah. of usage you will get out of it depends on how well standardized the I, I, people and, put into data. Or how shared the understanding. Yes, the quality. I like that. The quality of data, the quality of, of usage you'll get out of it will depend on how well you share the understanding of what you mean by that vocabulary. Yeah. I think this is a really good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> everybody who feels one way about it stand on one side of the room. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe one more question? Or should we just wrap it up? <laughs> okay. Thanks.